Um, and there's a lot of buzz about autonomous shipping, and we've seen some examples that are beginning to develop. But there are still some key questions around the evolution of this as a uh, potential development within the industry. And one of which is the, my idea, really, that um, having sort of been at sea for a few years, is that when you look at the diesel engine, there's a lot of reliability issues that uh, are and, um, reliability and liability potential issues around uh, having the diesel engine on the ship. So if we're going to evolve into autonomous shipping, what needs to be done with that? What about the architectural structure of the vessels and what about the technology on board to enable that to, to uh, evolve and become come into fruition? So I'm going to introduce now Odd Moen, who's head of maritime at Siemens, uh, to give his perspective. And then once he's finished, I'm going to bring on a, 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 the next panel to discuss some of these topics um, and see how things go further. So, Odd, the stage is yours, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. No. It's not working. Okay. In the last years, uh, electrification of the shipping industry has accelerated fast. The world first ferry here, Ampere, has been in operation for two and a half years. And the most and minor friendly of the construction vessel, Edda Fad, on the right hand side, has been in operation for one and a half year. Electrification, automation, and uh, digitalization will cause tremendous changes within different type of technologies, as well as structural change in the value chain in the entire shipping industry. Then, I think that was, uh, I will skip it. Uh, in the digitization age, the drivers of innovation are changing. Innovation will come from a more flexible environment. Today, innovation requires rapid prototyping, size networks and clusters. Crowdsourcing, open knowledge exchange to secure and not to lose competitiveness where the technologies today are working and performing smarter, faster and cheaper. Our company has a 170 years history. With 170 years of innovation, Siemens is well positioned to make disruptive technologies as a success. As our company was founded in 1847, in 2016, our company founded, founded the next 47. The next 47 will have a significant founding of 1 billion euro in the next five years. The fundings will primarily be used in partnering and founding of startups in selective innovation fields. Next 47 offers freedom to experiment, to innovate, to grow in an early stage of the market development. Through Next 47, startups can benefit of the best of the Siemens ecosystem for example, with more than 32,000 researchers in our global uh, research and development uh, activities and more than 17,000 software engineers. To turn more ideas into viable businesses, our goal are next for seven. The five fields into focus are autonomous machines, connected immobility, artificial intelligence, distributed education, and blockchain application. Battery powered vessels is not a new technology. Already in 1866, Siemens delivered the world's first battery operated vessel. 20 meter long, space for 30 passengers, powered with a little motor of 4. kilowatt. In the next 20 years, Siemens delivered more than two and all those vessels. At that time, Siemens manufactured their lead batteries by themselves, as we know today is developing and manufacturing lithium-ion batteries for the global company for marine application in Trondheim. A snapshot of other relevant challenges and of vehicle were also have turned to electrification. In Göteborg, a nine-kilometer route is served by all electric buses. 
The business equipped with a battery pack will be charged with renewable, renewable electricity. Volvo and Siemens has uh, working well together in this field. The energy consumption of electric buses is about 80% lower than diesel buses. Quiet and entirely exhaust-free operation, better urban environment and reduced climate impact. E-highways, trucks equipped with electric pantographs and traveling a public road is in operation for the first time. They are running exhaust-free. Siemens has installed an overhead line for electric and hybrid trucks in Sweden, north of Stockholm. Diesel trucks from the automaker Scania is going powering by electricity. A e-highway with about 80% FNG is about twice as efficient as transport with a diesel truck. That because electrical drives are more efficient. On top of that, transmitting electricity via overhead line is more environment friendly. FNG here is 99%. Siemens has developed also a new electric drive, five times more powerful than compatible drive systems. This record setting propulsion drive system successfully completed its first public flight June last year. To continue this journey successfully, we need these disruptive ideas and the courage to take risks. In addition, Siemens and Airbus agreed in 2016 for driving the development of electric public flight for developing regional airliners to be propelled with hybrid systems. Back to sea. The world's first battery powered workboat named Elfrida has been in operation outside the island Freya for the fish farming industry for four months. The batteries are charged during night. It is a small project, but an important step for securing a sustainable growth in the fish farming industry. The world first fishing boat Carolina has been operated for nearly two years in northern Norway. It's a new working environment for fishermen. No noise, no vibration, no exhaust gases. During night, the batteries are charged for only 60 Norwegian crowns in energy cost. These are days you cannot get a beer in this town for 60 crowns. Edda Freya, the world most environment friendly offshore vessel, delivered from Kleven to the ship owner Östensjö. The consumers of energy are nine propellers, 10 megawatt of advanced deck equipment, are powered from six variable speed diesel engine and six battery packs, resulting in 30% less fuel consumption compared to similar vessels. Let's back into the air. The F-35, Joint strike fight there. It's being built by Lockheed Martin, lead coalition, leading 600 suppliers around the world who must work as they are acting as one entity. More than 6,500 users is the Exercise Suppliers Network are also being brought online in more than 130 cities spanning over 30 countries and 17 time zones. Most Importantly, real-time online collaboration is a reality for both engineering in process and relevant design. All design and manufacturing data for each aircraft configuration must be managed as well as the data required to support the planes during the lifetime, up to 30 years. F-35 program is the largest user of the Siemens product lifecycle software capability in the world. Princess Yachts, a 2,300 staff company, marked its 50th inventory by implementing Siemens product lifecycle software to increase speed, efficiency, design freedom, as well as design to manufacturing, and at the same time 
enabled to control the red flow and the information. Princess Yacht is a long-standing partner with Siemens in product lifecycle software, where data are delivered directly to five-axis numerically controlled machines to give increased accuracy to a better surface finish, as well as storing information and manage workflows. Mindsphere is the answer from Siemens to open cloud-based operating system. By taking use of the experience of digitalization from the car and aerospace industry and implement it to the shipping industry, Siemens will make the future shipping safer, more environmentally friendly and profitable. Through digital collection, challenging maritime operation can be simulated and software analysis is not possible to gain insights in future vessel operations. Thanks to design modeling, challenging maritime operation can be simulated and how it impacts on the entire vessel as well as machinery. Digital analysis tools can map out the digital twins and then at the same time enable the most energy efficient operation. And it will also enable the ship owners to switch from calendar based plant monitoring to maintenance to condition based monitoring. Remote diagnostics from a centralized control center will give access to real time insights from vessels to advice from the next immediately. It will be a remote diagnostic from a secure storage and transmission will improve cyber security. That is the road we have to go into the topic of automatic vessel. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, actually, Ob's not going to stand on the podium with me. We've got his colleague Sigurd Vigerestad, who's going to join us as well, I believe, from Siemens, because you're more on the mind sphere side of things in the IoT. But I'd like to ask my other um, panelists to come up and uh, join me now. And that's uh, Sam Sills from um, Zem, Helle Hammer from C4, Ornolf Ran, Jan Rotek from Sintef, and Vegard Hofstein from Maritime Robotics. Now I wanted to take that introduction about the electrification of the, uh, the maritime industry to lead into a discussion now about where we're going within the maritime sector and we're talking about autonomous shipping. Um, I'm actually going to start, if I may, because I'm going to start with, with Sam, because we were talking about electrification, you work for Zen, they make batteries, and you're actually a naval architect as well here, as well. What do you, what the two or three main ingredients do you think are going to be necessary as we see this evolution from um, the electrification of the, or to the automation of the shipping. So, um, is that okay? Can you hear me okay? Yep. That's good. Um, first things are the propulsion methods. So with diesel and HFO, it's quite a lot of moving systems and uh, many moving parts. So that makes it very maintenance heavy. So some of the newer technology like um, hydrogen fuel cells and especially batteries um, they have much less moving parts, so there's much less maintenance, and this is quite a big step, I think, in the difference in autonomous uh, vessels. Um, one good thing about autonomous is you don't have any uh, crew as well, or very few, so that frees up a lot of space for um, more cargo, and uh, so that will make uh, the aerodynamics and the efficiency of it. Um, that give you as a naval architect a lot more freedom. Yeah, I think it does actually. Um, at the moment you see these big boxy bridges on top of ships and there's like sailing a wall across the ocean, so that's uh, a big one. Um, other things to think about is the distance as well. So uh, different routes have different challenges. If you're inshore in the archipelago around Norway or Oslo, then you have lots of rocks to negotiate, so that requires um, really good communication with the crew up the land. 
but then if you're out in the ocean, then um, things like the communication is not really there yet with satellites to be able to do so. I think that's a big part of the there are, there are There are still challenges where it's there as we, look, as we, as we see this, this evolve. Um, but also from the, from the IT perspective, from the things like perspective, Osman mentioned MindSphere. This is kind of like an IoT kind of um, cloud solution. How does that fit into the maritime world? It's like uh, from Siemens' perspective, our main, uh, the most important responsibility for us in, in regards to autonomous operation is to make uh, uh, products and solutions which enable uh, remote, uh, remote uh, operation. And uh, these products and solutions need to also be reliable because uh, without, uh, without the vessel uh, working, there is no trust, and without trust, autonomous operation will not uh, succeed. And also, as we've seen the, uh, some of the developments that are happening in, in Norway and in Finland, we see this, a lot of these sort of uh, collaborative projects that are emerging. And we've seen, and I, I've written something recently where I looked at a number of different sort of autonomous solutions that are appearing already, small scale there. And Maritime Robotics is involved in one of those as well here. What's your perspective then? You've obviously, what, what made you sort of, sort of come into this arena and just go, hey boys, here we are, new kid on the block, we're doing this, no, we don't need the crew. What's... Um, we, we did that 10 years ago, so uh, we were... Um... Pretty, very, pretty technology driven, we thought that this was cool. I think that was the, the start of it, and we saw that robots are were coming, especially drones were uh, far ahead of marine, maritime autonomy. So we saw this is very technically possible, it's been technically possible for many, many years. And now the kind of world changed a little bit, and I think there are a lot of effects, of course, going together. The, the most important barrier has been regulations and, I would say, psychology, mentality. Of, of, uh, of people accepting that this technology is possible. Um, so, yeah, the reason why we came was probably technology uh, missing. Have you found, a much, is it, have you found this, is, is this going to sound slightly odd? Have you found, found that you've become more accepted by the maritime community of late as the discussions about autonomous ships have really started to take hold over that 10 year period? Do you feel you've become more welcome into the uh, into the industry? Of course, uh, you kind of been used to kind of when you go around in like ten years, you were kind of you have learned to discipline yourself, not that you become too visionary and not too too crazy. Okay? But but today when I'm going around, I feel like very conservative sometimes. So uh, yeah, a lot of implementation definitely. And I've, I've seen also from uh, from all of, from your perspective from the. Um, you know, the sort of the uh, Syntech and Marantech, you know, the evolution and the research that you're, you've been involved in as, as well. What do you think is, is happening with the infrastructure that's going to make all of this? Um, first, um, we, should, we should probably clarify whether we are talking about what kind of ships we are talking about. Autonomous has a lot of meanings. I think our main interest is in unmanned ships. Yet, as uh, I said, Getting rid of crew makes it possible to get rid of all the safety systems, all the activation. You can build a system totally different. So if you are looking for disruptive technology, it's unmanned ships you are looking for. Increased automation of the bridge, that will happen in the south. That, that is an increasing uh, development that will happen. And I, I think, as uh, I was saying, that most of the technology is already available. So, so it's, it's a kind of... Uh, faith, I think, which was necessary. Uh, when we started the mini project in 2012, nobody believed it. Two years afterwards, everybody was in the bandwagon. So, so it was, I think, basically that the time was right for this. You see it in all the other sectors, and we actually see that shipping is, at least from our perspective, one of the most interesting, one of the sectors where you have the best business cases for fully unmanned operation. I mean, a lot of owners have been focusing on crew costs for a long time. They think that's an overhead. They want to really sort of use that. But at the moment, regulations don't, or international regulations don't allow for um, unmanned or autonomous ships. But national regulations are being... Um, the Norwegian government, for example, is, is looking at Trondheim and giving the permission for the Trondheim area to become 
how do you think? I'm going to actually go to Helly with this one, please, because um, you represent the uh, the insurance industry here on this panel, and um, from the insurance perspective, when you look at the advent of all these technologies, you're going to look at everything from a risk profile, from a risk perspective, and a liability perspective, importantly. And we, I've had a lot of discussions over the years about the role of the master on the ship. The master is God, the master is liable, the master can be put into a prison if he does the wrong thing at the moment. So where, from the insurance perspective, do you see this evolving? Well, first of all, gradually. Uh, I'd just like to say, leap of faith is not something we from insurance uh, <laughs> sort of like to, to hear. We like to a bit more security. Uh, this is going to be insurable. We are paying attention to what goes on. Uh, obviously, there have to be some regulatory changes. Uh, and we need some sort of guarantee security that the technology actually going to work and what will happen if it doesn't work. Because it's based on crew on board actually uh, correcting things. We will know a lot about uh, human failure. And everyone says, well, that's a big reason for, uh, for uh, incidents and claims that we have. Sure. But we don't have statistics on how many times a crew, a master, will actually intervene and then prevent something from happening. Uh, the master is sort of the person identified. That person, even under the current regulation, could easily be uh, in a, a remote uh, facility. Doesn't necessarily have to be on board. So you can have a designated captain that's responsible. So there are some possibilities here. When you go fully automa uh, autonomous, then there are more challenges uh, to come, and that's going to take a long time from a regulatory side uh, to fix, and from the liability. So well, we we're paying attention. Regal, from, a, from the, 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 the drone perspective, I guess, when we're talking about somebody actually having operational control of a unit, whether it's an airborne drone or a waterborne drone, there is that person who is operating something that's got the almost physical control of the thing through a remote operation. At that point, if that's defined as a drone, that isn't defined as a ship. It is a drone. Is there a significant difference emerging here whether the person, whether the autonomous ship has got a human in charge? Is it a ship or is it a drone? Are there differences? Okay, let me put it this way. It's a lot of confusion now going on of what is an autonomous ship. Mm. So, uh, also you see, I don't see misusing, but the, the, the word autonomous is sometimes a little bit misused. Also, it's very trendy to make an application and put autonomous. But one of, one of the reasons I'm asking but, is because I believe there's some discussion going to happen at the IMO yep. next week. Yep. One of that part of that discussion is going to be whether a per, whether a vessel without humans on board is defined as a ship. Yeah, it's 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 floating, isn't it? So it's a uh, ship, boat, floating object. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have I never thought about that. I would still call it uh, something that uh, maybe a ship or a boat or maybe Bernard can. Uh, it's. Uh... You have different types of legislation. You have the uh, UNCLOS, which is the laws of the sea. And there is some academic discussion whether an unmanned ship is a ship. But the, the legal people I've talked to, they are quite certain that we will be able to take this uh, step. We went from sail to steam to diesel, from 100 people on board to 15 people on board, with more or less the same regulatory uh, regime. So stepping uh, up to not really that difficult, and it's, I, I think it's no doubt that the, this will be a ship uh, a legislation that's uh, 300 tons or whatever mm. limits is a bit different. So, so these are ships. So if you have seen the Yara project, in, that is the finished ship. So uh, although there is some uh, academic discussions, I, I don't think that the, it's really a question. But we have to do something with the national legislation for sure. Yeah, I mean, we have some legislations um, that are going to evolve around. Do you think that example from the insurance perspective, Helly, is going to actually help then? Because you'll have some demonstrative local examples which will probably ease concerns, risk concerns, and will help about 
the international regulations? Absolutely, on the international regulation, you need that. Uh, I'm a, probably going to meet a lot of opposition. There are some uh, crew uh, providing uh, nations that I, uh, need to get on board as well, so it's going to be very difficult. What I discussed next week is a scoping exercise to actually go through all the regulation I have to see what they probably will need to change uh, in order to make sort of even a new code, probably, or, or uh, amend. And that's going to take a few years. And then, if you need a new convention, we're talking 10, 15 years to get that in place. Uh, to convince the IMO, you very often need those kind of uh, field trials uh, tests going on. What's going to be interesting is what are they going to do on the liability side on the testing? Uh, and who's going to pay for that if there is an incident? Uh, they go into another vessel and there is an oil pollution, lives lost. What are they going to do? And that's not easily fixed from our side uh, in a testing period. Uh, and when it, when it comes to the uh, the reliability, the redundancy here, when you've got um, the sort of connected vessel and everything's kind of supposedly sort of in from a sea perspective or from another sort of manufacturer's perspective, when you see how you're going to integrate solutions and create uh, the internet of ships, I guess the iOS or whatever, we may call it in the end, through the MindSphere or whatever, whatever platform, is are you going to have to eventually work with common ground? It's like um, all the students they are now prepared for the digital world, digital age. So they have sensors, they are, uh, they are uh, giving out data which are which are relevant for the operation. Then uh, the MySphere solution collects the data, so that's an open source uh, uh, solution which uh, then can gather data. But uh, all, all products, and also I think one of the big advantages and to get uh, to watch the autonomous operation is to have big industrial players like Siemens on board, because uh, we are heavily involved in other industries also, where uh, the autonomous or remote operation is not is not new for other industries. So we can gain or bring into this market experience from other. Industries where they have solved maybe also the regulations regulation, mm. um, by proving and showing that this works in, in other industries or are approved in other industries. So um, this is also how Siemens can uh, contribute to make more autonomous uh, vessels. And, and, and then, do you see a lot of other nations? Um, you know about Finland and Norway and the the, 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 the other nations beginning to really take note. and industries are definitely, uh, definitely uh, looking into more uh, automation, automated processes. Uh, for uh, in Germany, for instance, the car industry have come very, very far in that in that development. So we can bring in that uh, experience and, and put it into the marine maritime industry. And that's also what we've done uh, in other uh, examples where we have been elected. Uh, Providing electric, uh, electrical solutions for one type of uh, ship uh, system or vessel type, and then just uh, in, implemented that in other vessel types as well. So, yeah, what about the scalability of this sound? Because a lot of the, the conversations are relatively kind of in terms of electrification. What I see is a very sort of, uh, local scale, short sea shipping, not very large industrial vessels. You know? I know some ships that have got uh, auxiliary engines, perhaps, that have got the larger ships, the auxiliary engines that are battery packs or uh, fuel cells, perhaps. But what about scalability of the electrification of the industry? So, it really depends on where the ship is operating. So, uh, we had this really interesting talk yesterday about the Coastal Green program. And they have one pilot program which is um, operating, it's a 200 nautical mile journey and they have a 5.6 megawatt battery supply and that's enough to do that journey. And really that battery supply can actually be scaled um, down or a little bit up, actually quite a lot up um, depending on the size of the journey and the, the size required. Um, I'm not sure about 
hydrogen fuel cells and um, energy, how that can be scaled. But I think it's it's a similar, yeah. similar way. Well, we've seen LNG already starting to appear on ever larger ships, which is why if we if we can use that as sort of a, a model for the development, how are we going to see that evolve into the electrification? Or if we, I've been talking to you. First time I talked to you was probably about 12 years ago, and we were talking about some of the environmental challenges that are, are going on here as well. How have you seen the industry develop here, and can we make any comparison like with LNG or other uh, fuel sources? Do you want to... <laughs> I, I'm an electronics engineer, so I shouldn't say anything. But, um, Coming back to Edmund Chips, one of the big problems in that is that you don't have people work to the main parts. So electric propulsion is obviously a very good system. So, so that's why we see a lot of electric systems in all this. Uh, I think I know about three or four projects in different stages. And three of them are fully electric. One is probably going to be easily electric with uh, get sets on the deck so that you can easily replace it with water. In, gen in general, I, I think, uh, for instance, Rolls Royce has some of the calculations showing that removing all the, uh, all the calculation section of the set is just the market value. Like, sorry, increasing, uh, designing the ship differently, you could save up to 30% energy. So it, it's a green effect just in designing the ship as an ship. Mm. Uh, in addition to that, we also have this uh, possibilities of using alternate, for instance, hydrogen is. It's a difficult fuel in ships because you have enclosed spaces and hydrogen is extremely uh, explosive. So it may be easier to get acceptance for hydrogen in a yeah. ship, for instance. When you're doing your project in marine, um, the unmanned vessel that you've got under development at the moment, can you tell me yep. a little bit about it? Out, out of experience, I can also uh, tell you that probably the combustion engine has been the most frequent source of challenges on our own old small run man boats which we are uh, which we are using so we uh, we think that component can be uh, a, lot of, a lot of things with of course and um, also of course as Ernest said the way you can install an array or whistle is of course so much easier if you can have electric trust electric motors and thrusters uh, the maintenance part is also been mentioned of course the problem of course today is endurance also on the small, um, we've, we've been building boats within the kind of 30 feet range, 20 to 30 feet range, and uh, we really would like to have them operating about a week plus minus. And of course then endurance is uh, a problem. Um, the good thing is that you can actually with an unmanned boat slow down a little bit, because you don't need to get home to the, to, 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 to the, for dinner, obviously. And uh, that's a good thing, so you can slow down a little bit, but of course not, not down to zero. So you, meet, need, so you need to do something in the meantime, and in the meantime I think a more optimized generator, diesel generator, would be a good thing in combination with uh, electric motors. Then you also have a redundancy that the, the battery, for example, could give you in between. And you can change that apartment room for the fuel tank and the generator with a fuel cell. And in the future, maybe you can take it all out and have really a super efficient batteries. And are the weight of the batteries still a problem? I remember starting when I started looking at uh, the actual size and weight of batteries. They're one of the main, a uh, big limit. Yeah, the weight and the volume of the batteries. Yeah, compared to a fuel tank, yeah. or the, 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 the energy efficiency of yeah. when you call relatively small boats that we are doing yeah. is uh, is still a challenge. Yeah. And I think probably two years ago, yeah, it was quite a big problem, but what's really interesting now is uh, kind of the speed and the development of the batteries. And it, I mean, you see with Tesla and the electric car industry that it's, it's really accelerating. So I, I think that that curve will keep going. And I think that's really exciting for this folks especially. There will be a, a time where the, actual, the, the batteries will be light enough that you can put enough of them into a ship to make it significant. Yeah, um, different. I mean, the nice thing about the ship is um, the, when you have something really long, like a ship, really long extender, it's really efficient. So you can actually run it in a very, very efficient way. And so there is a lot of space for the batteries inside. Um, 
but also kind of see this idea that it's, uh, as we have to solve this energy crisis anyways, with like this whole place is running electricity, your phones are running electricity, everything runs on electricity, that um, I think that will also accelerate the need for batteries. So I think, as you say, I think the, the size and the, and the price is coming up really fast. So the, the, the economy of the battery are actually looking more, looking more favourable, and that will help when you're talking about the high levels of um, connectivity that we're likely to use as well. So is, is that, how can you sort of convince the industry that that's going to actually, there's always a level of sort of caution you heard Helly there, sort of like, they, 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 they don't find it that it's going to work, it's that they, they need that reassurance that it's going to work well, that it's going to be robust enough to do it properly, and continually do it properly. But how do you develop that assurance? Well, that's where the systems like MindSphere come into the picture, because then uh, using MindSphere we can uh, transfer the information from the vessel uh, onto shore, uh, showing the people on shore what's actually happening on board. And then by showing and visualizing uh, uh, data from, uh, from the operation, that makes actually uh, or build trust for the operation part. So that is a very essential part of, uh, of uh, this trust perspective as far as, far as I see, to get the, the mindset uh, people to believe that uh, that, that's, 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 that's one part of the ship operation side of things. But all, when we're talking about um, Sort of remote controlled vessels or autonomous vessels, we've got a number of them in the area, particularly a, a busy area. And then the, the authorities are going to be looking at that. Are they not going to have to have some sort of policing mechanism for autonomous ships? Because um, a, somebody watching over a, a spread of water is not going to be able to call on that ship and say, Can you alter 10 degrees before to starboard? So what sort of a process do you think is going to have to evolve here? We will see. I, I think one of the benefits and why, one of the reasons why I really think that uh, the maritime field is, is one of the most interesting applications for inland technology is that you actually have a lot of space in most areas. And this is one of the driving forces, I think, for deploying inland. However, um, we have been discussing with the coastal authorities in Norway and, uh, for instance, the other ship, Will be operating in uh, vessel traffic systems. I gather some of the area they're planning on taking that vessel is quite congested. Yeah, but, then they, but then we also have a, a, a traffic uh, control system. Okay. So you actually have a station what, uh, continuously monitoring the traffic. We have a project in Trondheim where we do not have that, but the, the traffic density is much lower. Uh, however, we are looking at uh, reserved lanes, for instance, okay. and various other things. So, so there are solutions to so this. So there'll be like a, a lane, uh, sort of in a traffic separation scheme for an autonomous yeah. vessel, perhaps. Or, something like that. Yeah, sort of no-go zone, no go zone for manned ships. Sam, is, um, with, there is only one thing that we should um, like. One problem towards one big problem at the moment is we. What, is what I learned from MTT here is that we actually don't have the communications possible at the moment um, for, uh, for example, to have video all the time. We don't have the satellites out there at the moment, um, so I think that's coming in the future. But um, a lot of stuff that is coming from LA with Elon Musk and his um, flying rockets in space and covering the globe and internet, I think when that happens, that will also accelerate this uh, safety and aspect of being able to monitor the boats. And, and then the question of who's going to be liable really starts to kick in then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just. First, picking up on uh, what was said uh, with standards and when you need to sort of someone need to come from our side for sure. Someone uh, that will go in this is going to work. Thank you, operation.
Siemens put into the digital uh, uh, development with Meister and other, other solutions. I think we will also see a much, much uh, faster development with this than we have ever seen before, so I think within two to three years. And just thinking about it, I think there's like three or four steps that we need to open first. And the first one is also have a market there as well, like the need for these boats to actually be useful. And um, I think that's to do with taking traffic off the road and uh, feeling it safer. Uh, another point I would think probably do with the communications, so making that safe. 
Um, in terms of the batteries and propulsion, that's that's pretty much there, I would say, in terms of efficiency-wise for short trips. Um, in terms of longer, like crossing big oceans, I would say there needs to be more work on an infrastructure as well. So. Um, Actually, as well, for the short trips as well, you know, when the ship comes in and say it has to be charged, then you need to have a big charging station for that. So, um, I think none of that has been kind of developed yet, so that's that's a while away. But it's very simple, which I think. It's kind of all solvable, but the technology is there, but it needs to be put together, I think. The whole thing is not Hello. Okay, on um, international voyage, you still need to change conventions. 10, 15 years, optimistic. Uh, so that's sort of the first. Uh, there is a missing uh, link here in the panel. Where are the owners? The operators? The ones that really want to buy technology companies these days. Uh, and it depends on whether this commercially will make sense in the end as well. Uh, and we're here as a risk management tool for them. And they're not exactly knocking on our doors at the moment. But I fully agree in terms of what you're saying that you will have automated processes to a large degree. If you have dynamic positioning, you will have one person sitting there, pressing a button, docking here, uh, and then that will be done fully auto uh, autonomous, if you like, uh, but with the possibility to intervene, which is sort of a big, big difference. A human in the loop. Helen, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time on this panel. It's been a wonderful discussion and it ends very nicely the day on the, the second day as we talk about disruption. So thank you very much.